If there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility, in humility, count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee must bend in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to talk to you this evening about something of enormous importance, a godly thing, something without which you can't go anywhere in the spiritual life, something that all of the saints were filled with, Humility. Humility is an absolute necessity to holiness of life. I'm going to tell you a radical thing. God is humble. Can you imagine that? God Almighty is humble. Now, you believe Jesus is Lord. I know that. Jesus is God, true God, and true man. Jesus humbled himself, the word of God said. Though he was God, he humbled himself. He accepted even death, death on a cross, the worst form of death imaginable. Why? Well, we're going to look at it. You have to go back to the book of Genesis in order to gain insight into some of these things. Genesis means the beginning. When you go back to the first chapter of Genesis, we know that God created all things out of nothing, ex nihilo, the saying goes in Latin. And after he had created it all, he pronounced it good, very good. Everything created by God is good. It would have to be. Coming from his own creating hands, goodness himself created all that it is, and it's good. But between the first chapter of Genesis and the third chapter of Genesis, something happens. And that something is very important. And you can't really understand this life, this combat of a life, without understanding what happens between the first and third chapters of Genesis. You remember what happened in the third chapter of Genesis, the serpent, the most cunning of all the animals the Lord God had made, came to Eve, who was called the mother of all the living. And the serpent said, did God really tell you you couldn't eat of the trees in the garden? And Eve said, no, it was just the tree in the center of the garden that God said we cannot eat of it or even touch it lest we die. And the devil, that one that Jesus would one day say, he's a liar, the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, said, surely you do not believe God. God just doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. Because I'll tell you what, if you will take the fruit of that tree, you will become like gods, knowing good and evil. Nothing has changed. The serpent 
still says the same thing. Does God really tell you you can't do this or you have to do that? Does the old Catholic Church, that old Polish Pope, does he tell you you can't do that? You believe that? You smart, sophisticated, educated people of the 90s, you still believe that stuff? Do you really believe that it's a sin to have sex outside marriage? To take that birth control pill, to have that abortion? Do you really still believe that dribble? Oh, the Catholic Church is just trying to keep you from being all you can be. Hey, if you listen to me, the devil says, you can be like a god. You can decide what is good and what is evil, independent from God, independent from his church, subjectively and arbitrarily. You decide what is good and what is evil. In other words, you become God. You decide when life begins. Who decides that? God. So now you're God. So you decide when life begins. You decide when life ends. You play God. Don't believe it? Check out the laws of this country. Abortion. Play God. Not convenient right now. Now Oregon has euthanasia, and we can decide when life will end, not only when it will begin. Play God. You decide. That's how it began. Let's look at it. The genesis of sin. What is it? Pride. The genesis of all sin is pride. Now, I don't mean that healthy pride. Pride in your family, pride in your profession, pride for doing a good job. That's good. That, that's not a bad thing. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about arrogance. I'm talking about that kind of arrogance which says, I do it my way, not his way. I make it happen. I have the power. I used to think I did. I used to think I was pretty good. I made it on my own. Nobody really helped me. I always, I always give people a test, you know, and we're, when I get to about this part, in case anybody doubts who's behind everything, everybody hold your breath. And I just keep on holding it. I'm going to let you know when you can take one. You just hold your breath, and you can't take another one, really, unless God says so, right? He's, he's the Lord of all that is. That's how important God is. Without him, we're nothing. What's humility, really? Humility is the acknowledgement of the truth. Humility isn't saying, I'm no good, I'm no good. No. Humility is saying, God is God, the great God of all creation, the one who brought everything into being by his own almighty power simply by willing it. I didn't have anything to do with that. God created me without me. Imagine that. He did something without me. He didn't even consult with me. Matter of fact, he didn't even call a committee together. Didn't even take a vote. God created us without us, but he will not save us without us. St. Augustine said that. God created us without us, but he will not save us without us. That's redemption. Oh, salvation's there, that's for sure. Jesus died so that all of us might live. What do we have to do, though? We have to accept it. We have to say yes. How do we say yes to God? By the way we live. By the way we live. And that determines how we live forever. And so the genesis of sin is pride, which results in disobedience. The pride, I can be like God. I'll play God. I'll decide what's good and bad for me. I'm educated. I'm sophisticated. I play God. That's pride. I can be like God. And then disobedience follows. I won't obey. I don't care what the church teaches. I don't believe that stuff. Well, you believe it or not believe it, it's what it is. It's true. And you can believe it or not. It is what it is what it is, and it's not going to change because you don't believe it. 
pride, disobedience, then what happened? Death. That's the scenario. Did you know there was no death before sin entered the universe? Pride, disobedience, death. Now, this is very important. If you learn principles, you can solve any problem. Pride, disobedience, death. That's the way it still works, even in the church. Some people think they're smarter than the Holy Father. Some think they're smarter than the teaching office of the church, the magisterium. Some would like to make up their own truth. Play God, in other words. doesn't work that way. You have to be humble in order to obey. Only the humble obey. Only the humble obey. And what happens to them? They're filled with life. The arrogant, they disobey, and they inherit death. Death. There's an interesting thing. I've traveled all over the world. I've seen the church all over the world. I have been to places where there is a spirit of arrogance, a spirit of disobedience, and a spirit of death at work, even inside the church. I have gone, I went to a place one time. It was most interesting. They almost strung me up after the first night. I just thought it was great. I knew I was getting to them. They didn't like what I was saying because I was asked by a bishop to preach on the moral law. And some of these people didn't believe in parts of that. They thought the church should keep its nose out of their moral business. And I had people say, God doesn't care about morality. How can you read the Bible and say God doesn't care about morality? How can you read St. Paul? How can you listen to the words of Christ and make a stupid statement like that? Well, they were convinced of it, but didn't faze me a bit. I just went right ahead and said what I had to say. They didn't accept it. They were so arrogant, they were blind. That's another one of the consequences of pride. It blinds you. I remember the first homily I ever preached after I was ordained a priest. Went home to my hometown, looked at the readings a couple days before, and I said, oh, no. It was one of those gospel readings where our Lord was saying something like this. No thief will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. No fornicator, no liar, no this, you know, how it goes on and on and on. I said, oh, no. I have to preach in my own hometown the first time on that? Oh, and I, I was kind of nervous because, you know, when you go home, a prophet has honor every place except in this is his own home. Those, I grew up with those people. But I did it. I said, well, I'll do it. I won't push it too hard. And so I got up there and started preaching. Now, I never intended to do this, but I want to tell you every single moral problem the world has ever seen that came out of my mouth. Boy, I hit it hard. There wasn't anything I left out. You name it. I, and I said, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. And it went on and on and on. And the poor pastor, I could see him off the corner of my eye. You know, he's thinking, you know, it's like we're already an hour into the Mass. And I'm not finished with the homily yet. <laughs> I finally finished, and I knew I was in trouble. And after we went out to greet the people, nobody left the church. <laughs> and I figured, uh-oh. They're in there trying to figure out how they're going to kill me. <laughs> Hang me, shoot me. <laughs> Finally, they started coming out. And they began to greet me and thank me. I said, thank you, Father. We haven't heard that for a while, and we need to. Every one of them stopped and thanked me. And there was one couple waiting in the wings. I could see them. And I made a mental note of it, and I knew I was going to get it from them. And so oh, about 40 minutes went by by the time all the people left. And this young woman, oh, she was maybe 30, 35, well-dressed, sophisticated, educated-looking. She came up to him and said, I grew up in this parish. And the priest used to preach like that. That's why I left the Catholic Church, because I didn't want to hear that moral drivel. I said, oh. She said, you ought to come down to, where did she say? Oh, Baltimore. You ought to come down to Baltimore. Nothing against Baltimore, but that's where she happened to live. You ought to come down to Baltimore, and, and Our Lady Pastor will teach you how to preach. <clears throat> I said, well, amen, sister, maybe she can. And maybe I ought to come down there, and she can teach me a thing or two. 
And then it kind of went on, and she, she gave me a, a, a lesson. You shouldn't talk about moral things. We don't need to hear about that. You know, you just talk about love and forget everything else. I said, what makes you think love and truth are somehow separated? They're not. Love and truth are names for the same one God. God's name is love. God's name is truth. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no opposition, no contradiction between love and truth. If I love you, I tell you the truth. In season or out of season. Convenient or inconvenient, like it or not, you're going to get it, both barrels. <laughs> because I tell you what, I have a soul to save too. I had a seminary professor used to say, he was from, uh, where was he from? Uh, Yugoslavia in those days, it would be Croatia now. Father Rudy, I have soul to save too, you know, and I'm not going to lose it for you guys. <laughs> That was Father Rudy, and he, wasn't, he meant it too, and he gave it to us straight, but we loved him. He wasn't a mean man. He was a good man. He was just trying to help us. He didn't want us to be confused in a very confusing time in history. So he gave us the straight truth right between the eyes, and none of us were confused. Some of us might not have liked it, but we had to accept it because it was so simple, so clear, so straight, you had to really stretch it not to accept that message. And that is a sign of love. When we give the truth to each other in love, you don't, you know, kill somebody with it. You try to be compassionate, but give it to them by all means. Sacred scripture is filled with references about humility. I'm just going to cite a few of them for you. There are so many more than these, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. In the book of Exodus, chapter 10, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to them, How long will you refuse to humble yourself? Humble yourself before me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will be bring locusts into the country. Now look what God's saying to Pharaoh. And remember, the word of God is transcendent. It's not locked into one time and one place in history. It transcends every time and every place, hence is relevant to every time and every place, including our time and our place. And God's saying, look, unless you humble yourself before me, I'm going to bring a plague into your land, locusts. God's saying that right now to the United States of America. Unless you humble yourself before me, you're going to get it. Stop playing God. Abortion, euthanasia. Who do we think we are? We play God. And I tell you solemnly, without any fear of error, God's going to pick us up and slap us silly. It's coming. It's real, real close. I can taste it. Can you? It's coming. Now, God's a merciful God. This doesn't have anything to do with, against God's mercy. God is merciful, God is just, God is loving. They all go together. Mercy, justice, and love are always together. You, could, you don't have any authentic mercy without justice. And you don't have any authentic justice without mercy because they both flow from love. God very often chastises his people. Why? To get even with them? Punish them? No, mostly to wake them up. My old uncle Tony used to say some people need to get hit between the eyes with a two-by-four just to get their attention. You got that saying in Tennessee, too? <laughs> you know people like that, too, don't you? I, I was one of those people most of my life. You know, you kind of go along, and you don't pay any attention to anything, and it, sometimes you, you, you got to get a beating to wake up. And I had my share of them. Now, that's not anything other than mercy. Very often, I, I talk with people. I travel all over the country. Uh, distraught mothers and fathers will talk to to me, oh, my children, my son, my daughter's in trouble, my son's taking drugs, or whatever it might be, and they just won't listen. What can I do? I said, well, I know you're praying. Keep on praying. And I said, but what, what else? I said, God's going to take care of it. Give them to the Blessed Mother. She's a good mother. She knows about the pains of a parent. And then watch for this sign. When they hit bottom, when they get sick, when they get thrown in jail, when they get AIDS, 
know that God's mercy is close at hand. Because I'll tell you something, it's a hard saying. It's a very hard saying, but, but, it's better than hell. You know, I got to put it in plain English, it's better than hell. You might as well wake up here and have a chance to repent and to receive the Lord's mercy rather than just go skipping and dancing on your merry way, have nothing ever happened to you, die suddenly. Ooh, that's frightening. That's a frightening thing. God's mercy will chastise us. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, it says in Deuteronomy, that he might humble you. Why did God lead the chosen people 40 years in the wilderness? That he might humble them, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. I don't know about you, but right about now, I'm 50 years old, and I feel like I have 10 years on the Israelites. <laughs> they only wander around the desert 40 years. I've been wandering around this desert 50 years. Some of you a lot longer than that. All kind of trials in this life, right? Sicknesses, uh, discouragements, loss of loved ones, all kinds of trials, difficulties, sufferings. Why? God's been leading us through the wilderness of this life to test us, to see what was in our heart, if we would obey his commandments or not. Now look here. Anybody can say, Lord, Lord, when everything's going well. Anybody can obey the commandments when all is well. But stub your big toe and see what happens. Right? It gets harder. It's a lot harder to, to praise the Lord and to obey the commandments when stress and trauma comes. You know, the devil knows all about that. Let me tell you about one of his tactics. If he wants to get you, so let's say you're doing well. I know a lot of you live your faith very zealously. You're doing damage to the enemy's kingdom. He doesn't like you at all. And so he wants to trip you up, but he can't, maybe he can't get you with some of the old sins he used to get you with. So what he'll do is he'll try to arrange circumstances. And don't you think that the fallen angels don't have power? Now, God has more power. The good angels have more power, so you don't have to worry about it, but you just have to be smart. You just have to be smart. The devil's like a vicious dog on a short chain. You know, a dog on a six-foot chain, if you've got any brains, you don't get within seven feet of them. You're in good shape. But he'll work on you. Maybe you'll get sick. Now, I've been sick. I want to tell you something. This better be a good mission. Because if you knew what I had to go through the past week, <coughs> and my poor guy Kurt here, just to tell you a few things that have happened to us in the last seven days, Kurt kicks a filing cabinet and breaks his toe, <laughs> bends over and throws his back out so he can't even hardly walk. And then he gets poison oak. He was out hunting, and he gets poison oak so bad that we nicknamed him Job. You got a dung hill here in Tennessee? We're going to put old Job on the dung hill and let him sit there for a while. I got the flu, a terrible sore throat, the worst sore throat I've had in about 10 years. That's why I'm, I've got this water and I'm praying and hoping that my throat's going to hold out. I don't know if it will or not. You know what? Cluster headaches are, like migraine headache, cluster headache. Well, I had those for the last six days. I couldn't get out of bed for five days. I made it to the plane. I would say we were in 10 minutes of canceling this whole thing. I'm glad we didn't, but we just had to trust God that somehow we would get through this. Last week, we, our computer wore out, so we had to get a brand new expensive computer, and we spent 30, 40 hours putting all the data in, the software and so forth blew up the hard disk for no reason. <laughs> All in one week. This better be a good mission. <laughs> hey, you all better be saints before this is finished. <laughs> to test you, to know what was in your hearts, we need to be tested. You know, love has to be tested to find out if it's authentic or not. It's really easy to say I love you until it costs me something. 
You know, husbands and wives know about that. You know, talk is cheap. You know, anybody can say, I love you, but then, you know, when it costs you, we'll find out how much you love somebody. Every once in a while, young people will come to me and say, oh, we're in love, Father. We want to get married. I say, wonderful. Great. Usually the girl, the, the boys never talk to me for some reason. <laughs> <coughs> Unless Mama forces them to. But the girls will often talk to me. Girls are usually, not always, but quite often more spiritual uh, than men. And um, I said, yo, I think he loves me, Father. Well, that's good, honey. I'm glad he loves you. Uh, how old are you now? Well, I'm 17, Father. Oh, that's wonderful. 17. That's a ripe old age. Now, <clears throat> you know, we'll see what, what happens. How can I tell if he really loves me? Well, if he respects you, number one. Does he respect you? Do you pray together? I'm going to tell you something. In this day and age, if young people are in love, they better start praying together from the first moment. I have a couple friends in Wyoming. They're ranchers. They grew up in Detroit together, of all places, and they were childhood sweethearts. They never went out on a date without going to church and praying the rosary together. Can you believe that? Never. All the time. And they started going out when they were 16, got married when they were 20. They didn't have any trouble, really, because every time they went out on a date, they, they had a mutual agreement. They went to church, they prayed the rosary together, it only took 15, 20 minutes, and then they went out and had a good time. They've been doing the same thing now for 40 years, married 40 years. They have several children, including a boy who will be ordained a priest in a few months. They have a daughter who's in my religious order. Pray together, and you'll stay together. For God abases the proud, but he saves the humble. We don't have to go any further than that. God abases the proud. I mean, he casts them down. But what does he do with the humble? He saves them. God saves the humble? Please, Lord, let me be humble. You know, God abases the proud, but he saves the humble. I want to be humble. In Proverbs, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of humble spirit with the poor. Again, in Proverbs, a man's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit or humble will obtain honor. In the Gospels, we know the same thing is told us. In the Gospel of Matthew, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. If you want to be great, serve others. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I remember the night before my ordination to the priesthood. The founder of my religious order and I were in Rome, and we stayed up all night in the chapel of the house where we were staying. We prayed together, and he would talk to me like a father talking to his son all night long. I don't remember much of what he told me that night except one thing. He said very many beautiful things. We prayed for hours, but I remember only one thing of what he told me. It stuck with me. He said, wherever you go and whatever you do, go as a servant. Go as a servant. Servants do hard things. Servants do dirty things. Servants don't expect recompense. You know, you can never be disappointed. Go as a servant. Oh, they didn't appreciate it. So... In this world which seeks to be served rather than to serve, Christians go as servants. Jesus said, I have come to serve, not to be served. Now that's easy to say, but do we live it? Do we live it? When somebody starts treating you like a doormat and walks all over you, can you take it? Can you humble yourself? Or do you get... You feel yourself getting, you know, kind of like the hair raises on the back of your, like an old hound dog, you know, and he starts growling. you got to humble yourself. Humility brings peace. It brings great peace. You're not being a doormat. That humiliation is a springboard to heaven. Remember that. There's one way to grow in humility. It's not an easy way, but it's the only way to really grow in humility. It's called humiliation. One time a woman came to me, 
and said, Father, I know I need more humility. I'm too proud. I know humility is important. I know it is a Christ-like thing. I would like to be a humble woman. I said, well, God bless you. That's a wonderful aspiration. She said, would you pray for me that I can be humble? And I said, oh, yes, you bet I will. <laughs> and I did. A week later, the woman came back, and she was hopping mad. And she said, you didn't pray for me. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you just didn't pray. I said, I need to be more humble. Well, I did, I did. I prayed a lot that you would be more humble. She said, everything has gone wrong. One thing after the next. I said, you mean like humiliating things? Terrible humiliating things all week long, one after the other. I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Honey, that's called exercise. Exercise. If you want to get strong biceps, you exercise your biceps. If you want a strong back, you exercise your back and so forth. No exercise, no increase in strength. That's the way it goes in virtue. You want more humility, you have to exercise it. You want more faith, you got to exercise faith. You want more hope, exercise it. Charity and so forth. Now, most of us are too darn lazy to exercise. But God, who is a good coach, will exercise us to within an inch of our life. He will bring these things to us. He will exercise us in patience and in humility. I, I remember when I went into high school, I was a fanatic about football. How's Tennessee doing this year in football, all right? Well, I had a football coach my, my freshman year. He was legendary. Bear Hamlet. This guy, was an, he looked like a bear. He was the hairiest man that had ever been created by God. And he weighed about 330 pounds, and he was fearsome. And he had a reputation. We were only a Class B school, and we regularly beat AAA schools and went to the championship in New York State. We started in the summer, and he would, I remember my freshman year, he ran us to within a literal inch of our life. I have never been stretched so far physically, and I was a Green Beret in the Army, and, and they push you a little bit too. But this man pushed us within an inch of our life. We hated him. Within two weeks, we wanted to get him, but everybody was scared of him. <laughs> and that went on and on and on. And finally, the first game came in September. I remember it so well. I, I did well in football. I, I played varsity my freshman year. There were only two of us. We won 84 to nothing. <laughs> it wasn't really a football game. It, it was a stomping. We, we beat them so bad. They were so beat up that for two games they couldn't really play. Uh, and then we began to understand what this coach had been doing. He, he wanted us to win. He's a good coach. And so he pushed us beyond our limits. Sometimes God does that with us. He'll push us beyond our limits. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. You think you can't go on another second. That happens to me all the time. If, if you knew how many times I've quit, you wouldn't believe it. But, you know, what, what am I going to do? You know, I say, okay, Lord, I quit. <laughs> I've had it. I'm, I, forget this preaching stuff. <clears throat> I ain't standing up there. No more. I'm not going to do it. No more. Forget it. And the Lord said, okay, what do you want to do? Drive a cab? <laughs> You want me to get your job? And then, you know, you get over it, and you come back and try again. Why does God test us? Because he loves us, because he wants us to grow. You've got to be humble in order to take that testing, in order to see what you're really made of, and you're made of the right stuff, because God made you in his own image and in his own likeness, and he wants you to be great with the greatness of Jesus Christ. One of the great saints and doctors of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, tells us that what I have come to understand is that this whole groundwork of prayer is based on humility, and that the more a soul lowers itself in prayer, the more God raises it up. I don't recall his ever having granted me one of the very notable favors of which I shall speak of later, if not at a time when I was brought to nothing at the sight of my own wretchedness. The foundation of this whole edifice of prayer is humility. Nothing matters more than humility. 
And so I repeat that it is a very good thing, excellent indeed, to begin by entering the room where humility is acquired rather than by flying off to all the other rooms. Begin with humility. Very often we will be falsely accused. Very often people will think that we did something when we didn't. I, I, people suffer so much from this. That, oh, my brother-in-law did this, or, or they looked, they, she looked at me funny. <laughs> and they're crushed by it. So what? Don't worry about that stuff. Kids get crushed by this stuff. You know, in school, kids suffer. Peer pressure, you know. Uh, they worry so much about what other people think to the point where it determines the clothing you wear, how you talk, everything. That's a slavery. You've got to break free of that slavery. God doesn't want you to live like a slave. St. Teresa says it's better to us, for us to abstain from self-justification when we're falsely accused. And this happens all the time. I remember preaching on this two years ago at a Carmelite monastery. And I was in, there were, it was a monastery, Carmelite nuns, and there were secular Carmelites there. And I really got to preaching, and you've got to be humble, and you better be humble. Within a month, God put me in a situation that so crushed me, that so humiliated me, that I didn't think I was going to make it through the whole ordeal. I was falsely accused of, of things. We had, we believe it or not, we had priests in a certain diocese preaching the Sunday homilies on me. <laughs> not on Jesus, not on the gospel, they were preaching on me by name. And, and some of the names used weren't very good. <laughs> now that's humiliating, that, that's unbelievable. When it happened, I, couldn't, I could scarcely believe it. They didn't like the bishop. And the bishop had appointed me to a position of authority, and so there was a lot of trouble over it. I had to bite my tongue. I had to shut up. You know, the tendency for an old fighting type like me is, you know, get in there and defend yourself. Give them what fur. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. But you can't. And so I remembered a lesson I'd been taught in the, when I was a novice. I had gone through a year and a particular man then started to get jealous about a, something that I was doing and began to proceed to try to get me thrown out of the monastery and I wanted to retaliate but I just shut up and the Lord said you just be quiet you let me fight your battles for you don't you worry about anything you just be quiet you be humble you be silent and so I did that for once in my life and that poor man, he was thrown out. And sometime after that, I left for another reason, and I didn't know what was going to happen. I had a call from the director of the seminary saying they expected me to come, but it looked like I wouldn't be now, and that was a shame. And he said, we have a room for you. I said, well, I have no money. I can't come. Five minutes later, the telephone rang. It was that man who had tried to really caused me trouble in novitiate. And he found out I was out of there, and he said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, you have to be a priest. I said, well, whatever God wants. There was a pause, silence. He said, I know what it is. You need money. He said, you come down here to New Jersey right now. I will give you all the money you need. That man sent me to the seminary and paid for everything. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are as far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. So just shut your mouth <laughs> and let God fight your battles for you. Don't worry about retaliating so soon. God will take care of it. He'll do it better than you can, believe me. Don't worry. If God is for you, who can be against you? So if you're innocent, don't worry. St. Teresa says, the example of Jesus in his passion is what we should follow. He accepted the humiliation. Now, he was innocent, perfectly innocent. None of us are as innocent as our Lord. And he was silent in the face of that unjust persecution. Now, imitation in accepting humiliation, St. Teresa said, it requires neither giftedness, bodily strength, or help from others. Okay, you can be 
you can imitate our Lord in accepting humiliation, and you don't have to be a big muscle man. You don't have to be gifted. You don't have to have a charism for it. Just do it. Like that old commercial says, just do it. That's all. Just do it. We're all guilty of faults and sins for which we are not blamed. Now you think about it. How many times did you get away with it? <laughs> you know, I've gotten away with it a lot. You know, you do something that you shouldn't, you know, maybe say something that you really shouldn't have, but you get away with it lots of times. So that one time when you're unjustly accused, accept it and unite it to the Lord's passion. And there's power. And you'll have peace. And I'm going to guarantee you something. If you don't do that, you won't have peace. Can you ever remember a time where you shot your mouth off, retaliated, got angry, returned a curse for, with a curse that you're at peace? Nobody's ever at peace doing that. But I can tell you that if you can make yourself just be quiet, just even if you have to run away, just be quiet. If you can force yourself to do that, you will maintain your peace much better than if you had retaliated. The good example of silence gives to the accuser and to others uh, is especially powerful. You know, somebody unjustly accuses you or jumps all over you without legitimate cause, you maintain silence. That's like heaping burning coals on your enemy's head. They're going to think after a while and say, I shouldn't have done that. And you're going to edify them. Maybe they'll come and apologize. The person who usually remains silent under criticism gains great freedom from concern and worry about others' actions and thoughts. Peace is so important to have your peace so you can pray, so that you can enter into union with God. Don't give that up for anybody or anything. And so what? Who cares what people think of you? What do you care that this one or that one thinks this or that about you? Listen, try to do what's right. Try to please people. But then, if you can't, let it go. Don't worry about it. Don't agonize over it. Be at peace. Now, as I said, the real acid test of humility is always obedience. We've got to ask ourselves, do I have an obedient spirit? If I have an obedient spirit, that can be traced back usually to humility of heart. The humble obey. The arrogant disobey. An arrogant person won't accept church teaching on this, that, or the other thing. A humble person is more la likely to accept that church teaching. Now, we've had a lot of trouble in recent years with this kind of a thing. One hates to talk about it. It's embarrassing. It's one of those family problems that we don't like to broadcast abroad. But the media loves to get hold of it. And, of course, they hype it up and they overplay it. You know, this theologian is against that one and the Pope and then this and that. And, you know, they just play that right up. It makes it look bad for the house of God. But look, none of us are above the church. Not a single one of us has been given the authority of the Holy Father and the Magisterium. What's our business? Our business is to accept the teaching of Jesus Christ which comes to us through his church. Don't think you can separate Jesus from his church. This is a fallacy. Don't think you can say, Jesus is Lord. He's my personal Lord and Savior, but I don't have any use for that old Catholic church. Don't think you can make that statement, because you can't. Because Jesus and his church are one. He is the head of his mystical body. The church is his mystical body. Don't perpetrate an act of spiritual decapitation, trying to separate the head from the body. Jesus won't die. The church won't die. But you might, spiritually and morally. Don't separate Jesus from his church. Accept the teaching of the church as the teaching of Jesus Christ, for that is what it is. It takes humility to do that. It takes humility to obey and say, yes, Lord, I accept it. Yes, Lord, I will do it. It's hard. You know the big one on this? Maybe later in the week I'll address it. The big one on this was artificial contraception. You know, we've read a lot about that, humanae vitae. People don't understand it. I, I don't blame uh, people who have 
trouble with it because they weren't, it wasn't explained well. The Pope explained it well, but a lot of people below him didn't. And so uh, the, the poor lay people, they didn't understand the teaching, and so they rebelled. They think, well, they have to have an indefinite number of children. They said, but I can't do that, physically, financially, everything. Well, the church never said that that's what you have to do. But a lot of people don't know that. <clears throat> they don't know the teaching. They don't understand the sacred nature of human sexuality. But if you have a humble spirit, you can learn. You can learn that when a husband and wife enter into the beauty of God's love, which is in marital love, when that mutual self-donation takes place, it images the love of the Trinity, the Father loving the Son and the Son loving the Father from all eternity, that love is fruitful. That love breathes forth the Holy Spirit. That's Trinitarian love, and that's what married love images. And so husband and wife in that mutual interchange of love are engaged in a godly thing, and that is fruitful love. That's the way it is supposed to be. But there are times when you can defer the birth of another child, even indefinitely. The church teaches that. We know that. Natural family planning. I saw it in your diocesan newspaper. They have uh, some kind of a um, seminar or something on that. Everybody should know about that. You know, the younger people that are getting married or that are married, if you have a good reason, fine. That's church teaching. You've got to be humble, though. To accept it. What happened was a lot of people in their arrogance said, no, I'm not going to accept that church. See, they didn't even know what the church teaching was. They just got haughty, arrogant, and said no. And that's it. And what happened was then, they went on and they began to purport to live their Catholic life in sin. And you better believe there is sin, serious sin, in that kind of arrogance. And so what happens? Well, remember I told you that First homily I preached, out, I was outside my church then, and that young lady came, and we got into that argument, and at a certain point she was screaming at the top of her lungs, and she said, I can't see a thing you're saying. And I never say things like this, I really don't. But I said, no, I know you can't see a thing I'm saying. You know why? She said, no, why? I said, because you're blind. What do you mean I'm blind? I said, you're blind. You're morally blind. Why am I morally blind? Because you take an artificial contraceptives and you just receive Jesus in Holy Communion, committed sacrilege. You're blind, you're deaf, you're dumb. Now tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> tell me I'm wrong and I'll apologize to you on my knees. Believe me, if I was wrong, she'd have let me know it in a thousand different ways. But she began to cry because I was right. I was right. I prayed for her, and I continue to pray for her. She was blinded because of the arrogance, and it can happen to all of us. I lived that way most of my life. I don't look down on that. I was one of those people for 37 years of my life. I sympathize with that. But because I sympathize with it, I can't confirm her in her errors. It is not pastoral to confirm someone in mortal sin. It is pastoral to tell the truth in love, to liberate the captives, to set them free, free with the glorious freedom of the children of God. That's authentic lo love. That's not phony love that says, oh, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. No, you're not okay and I'm not either. We're both sinners. And we need to repent and we need to just tell the truth. We need to enter into that truth, allow it to liberate us. That's a beautiful thing. My dear friends, you have to be the light of the world, and humility is the beginning. That'll light the light. That, that'll really set the blaze going. If you get, get into this humility, God will do great things for you. It's how Jesus struck down evil. When you look at it, redemption came about through the humility of God. Look at that crucifix, and look at it for the rest of your life, and think about what it means to you. Think about that. Savior, Jesus, he is God, a divine person. He humbled himself, accepting even death, death on a cross to break the stranglehold of evil. Where'd that evil come from? It came from pride that resulted in disobedience, that resulted in death, mainly moral death. 
Jesus broke that through the power of humility. There's great power in humility. You know the devil is afraid of humility more than anything else. I remember a story from the life of the great St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis, of course, was an enormously holy man, and very often he would be called upon to exorcise people possessed by the devil. But every once in a while, St. Francis, who was a greatly humble man, he'd run into a situation he couldn't quite handle it. And you know what he did? I found this most interesting. St. Francis would threaten the devil with Brother Juniper. You know who Brother Juniper is? Some, you, some third order Franciscans here probably. Brother Juniper was the most humble of all the early brothers. He was a fool for Christ's sake. You know, he, he didn't want anybody to think he was other than a fool. And the great St. Francis would threaten the devil. He said, I'm going to go get Brother Juniper if you don't get out of that man right now. <laughs> and the devil would get scared and he'd run away. One time, Brother Juniper was... was yeah, absolutely. And one time, Brother Juniper was coming through the countryside and there was a young man possessed by the devil in, in this house in the woods and he, well, he, he jumped up and ran out of the house naked. And his parents ran after him. He ran through the woods. They, after a mile, they finally caught up with him. said, what's wrong with you? Shook his head and said, that fool Juniper is a mile that way and coming fast, and I don't want to see him. <laughs> That's what the devil thinks about humility. Now, you apply that to your own life. If you have a humble, gentle spirit, the devil is going to not get his way with you. I remember when I was a novice, my first spiritual director, he, t he tried to help me a lot. During the week, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my own testimony. I have a rather strange personal testimony. Some of you know about it. And I'm going to probably, uh, I don't know, maybe Wednesday night, I think they're, we're kind of emphasizing the youth on Wednesday evening. So, um, But you, you old people come too. <laughs> so I won't feel alone. But I'll probably share that testimony Wednesday night. But one of the things, I, I was trying to overcome years of worldliness and years of doing things my own way. And it's hard, you know, when you get used to being boss. And, and at one point, my spiritual director said, boy, you got a hard head. He said, you, sometimes it seems to me it'd be easier for you to jump into hell with both feet than humble yourself a little bit. I said, well, yeah, I guess that's probably true. And he said, well, he said, you better do it. He said, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. I want you to get so little the devil can't even see you anymore. <laughs> I never forgot that. You become so little, so humble, the devil can't even see you anymore. That's the way to do it. Become little. Don't try to be a big shot. Don't try to be greater than everybody else. Consider yourself the least of the brethren. Take the last place at the wedding feast so God might call you up closer to himself. For those who humble themselves will be exalted, and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. I've been humbled many times in my life because I've tried to exalt myself. I still do it subconsciously. I don't mean to do it anymore. I don't do it on purpose anymore, but I still do it. And God is still letting me go right on my face out of love out of mercy. It happened this week. You know, it's happened to happen any minute now because I, <laughs> I feel my voice is going to go and I'm going to stand here like a fool with nothing coming out. <laughs> Accept the humiliation in order to be humble. If you are humble, you will be like Jesus. And Jesus set the captives free. You will be like the Lord who came to liberate all his father's children from the slavery to Satan, to sin, and to eternal death. I began to pray a litany of humility some years ago, and I prayed every day, begging God to grant me that beautiful grace of humility. O oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me, it begins. And listen the way it goes. It's quite interesting. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, O oh, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, Oh, that's a hard one. How could we possibly say that? From the desire of being loved, deliver me, O oh Jesus. Well, what does it mean? It, it means that I should not have an inordinate desire that everybody loves me. You know what's going to happen if I have that? I'm going to stop preaching. I'm going to stop telling you what you need to hear, and I'm going to start telling you what I think you want to hear. 
If I have that inordinate desire to be loved, deliver me from that, Lord Jesus. And from the desire of being extolled, you know, sometimes we like to be extolled. Oh, he's a mighty preacher. He does this and that. Oh, Lord, deliver me from the desire of being extolled. Let me be little. And whether they spit on me or exalt me, it's all the same. From the desire of being honored or praised, deliver me. From the desire of being preferred to others, of being consulted, of being approved. And then from the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. Are you afraid to be humiliated? I am sometimes. It's not a pleasant thought. But you know, our Lord was humiliated more than anyone because he's God. Just think about that. You and I, we're a lot less than God. And so when we're humiliated, the humiliation is much less than what Jesus suffered. But it's good for us. Accept it. Accept it when it comes. Don't go looking for it. But if it should come, offer it to the Lord and allow it to build you up rather than drag you down. And from the fear of suffering rebukes, of being forgotten and calumniated, from the fear of being ridiculed, wronged, or suspected, deliver me, O oh Jesus. If we can pray that way, if we can desire that kind of humility, I tell you something, you will be great with the greatness of Jesus Christ because humility is the absolute necessity for holiness of life, for spiritual greatness. I wanted to begin this Advent mission with this talk on humility because it is the best place to begin. If we can enter into the humility of Christ, we can enter into holiness. And if we enter into holiness, we enter into the meaning of human existence. And if we enter into the meaning of human existence, we will begin to be actualized in our potential. We'll begin to be happy. And I'm going to promise you something solemnly before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. If you will do that, if you will strive for the humility of Jesus Christ, one day when time gives way to eternity, when the dust and smoke of battle are stilled, and when you leave this world and stand before God, you will hear these blessed words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. O oh, house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. It can be said without any fear of error that you and I live in a very strained time in history. A time where indeed nations are raising the sword against each other with increasing zeal more and more often. The threat of the sword hangs over us. But as the Holy Father reminds us, peace is not merely the absence of war. Peace is something that has to come from inside the individual human heart. All the divisions that we see in the world, country fighting against country, factions inside individual countries, families breaking down, husband against wife, wife against husband, children against their parents, parents against their children, all of this division can be traced to one source, the division within individual human hearts. It is called sin, in plain English. It is called sin. There is no unity other than that which subsists in the truth. Someone gave me a cartoon before Mass. They didn't realize how fitting it was. It was something about the word that we have to stand on and 
This cartoon character was standing on a stone and it said truth on it. That's the word that we have to stand on, the reality that we have to stand on. But we have a crisis of language today. Do we really know what the truth is? I'm going to talk about three essential words this evening. Truth, conscience, and freedom. Words are very important. They convey to us underlying realities. We live in the home of the free, the land of the brave. The preamble to our Constitution holds that we hold these truths self-evident, that every man has the right to life, liberty, liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> and I will be much happier now. As a nation, and as a people, as individuals, we would say that freedom is very important to us, and it is. Freedom is a great good. Freedom is a right. Every one of us has the right to freedom. Now, I'm going to tell you that we are in great danger in our country, which we love, and in the world in general. We are in danger of losing our freedom because we don't really know what freedom is. We are in danger of losing our freedom for we have divorced it from truth. We are in danger of losing our freedom because we have failed to form our consciences to the objective norm of truth. And unless we do something about it, our culture, our country, indeed all of Western civilization is in danger of going the way of those other civilizations which unraveled morally. We will go the same way as the Romans and the Greeks. They became immoral cultures and they unraveled. Right now, we run the risk of fulfilling the prophetic words of the author, T.S. Eliot, who said, if we don't watch out, we'll go out not with a bang, but with a whimper. Not with a nuclear explosion, but with a pitiful whimper, because we did not raise our voices against those forces which are even now at work. When I was very young, it seems like so long ago, but it isn't that long ago, I've lived 50 years, and the world has changed so much. When I was a young man, this was a very Christian country. We had very strong moral values. If you put some of the things on television that we have now back then, they definitely would have locked you up and thrown away the key. Now we call that progress from there to here. I call it regress, not progress. We say that is freedom. We say that is guarded by the First Amendment. Watch out what your definitions are. When I was a young man, I remember my first love. Do you remember your first love? I remember mine. Her name was Rose. She was five years old. <laughs> and I was about six. Rose was the most beautiful thing that I had ever seen, such as a six-year-old boy counts beauty. We became good friends, so not boyfriend, girlfriend kind of thing. Good friends, though. We grew up together. We lived within two blocks of each other. We went to the same parish church, same school. And we passed through that tumultuous time of the 60s into the 70s, that time, you know, the me generation. I got to be me. I got to be free. 
when everybody was crying out for freedom. We wanted to break free of the old-fashioned shackles of our grandparents and our parents, the shackles imposed on us by religion, by a stodgy kind of morality. Rose and I used to talk about that, how great it'll be when we grow up and we can leave. We can leave that little one-horse town and go wherever we want to and be free. What a great thing to be free. We used to talk about truth, too. We would hear it every once in a while in church, some passage from Scripture. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You ask somebody nowadays, what's the truth? And you'll get as many answers as you have people. They will give you their personal opinion. The truth is not a subjective construct. Let's start there. Truth is not whatever you want it to be. The truth is what it is. Whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, whether we believe it or not, the truth is objective in, in character. Now, we've had a lot of bad philosophy for several centuries, and you may have never read a philosophy book, but I assure you that philosophy makes its imprint upon you because it makes its imprint upon society. We have a kind of subjectivism which would have us believe that if we think it's true, then it is. Well, if it's good for me, I'll do it. If it's good for you, well, you do it. But what might be good for you might not be good for me. If Catholic morality is good for me, well, fine, you go ahead and do that, but don't impose it on me. You see what I mean? The truth becomes a subjective construct. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ, who is the truth, never intended that truth be constructed as the result of a democratic vote. I don't care how many people vote that the truth is this, that, or the other thing. If it's not in accord with objective reality, then it's not. If you think an oak tree is a banana cream pie, number one, you're demented <laughs> or have bad eyesight. And number two, no matter how sincere you are about that, it's not going to change. That oak tree isn't going to turn into a pie, whether you want it to or not, no matter how much you desire it. You see, you can be just as sincerely wrong as you are sincerely right. The truth is what it is, what it is. Now, how do we know what the truth is? With so many voices coming at us, even inside the church. Let me tell you something. Inside the Catholic Church, you can get a moral opinion that will fit your lifestyle no matter what it is. Oh, I hate to say that, but I know it's true. One person may feel that divorce and remarriage is something that needs to be accommodated for them. And one priest tells him, oh, no, no, you can't do that. If you're validly married in the Catholic Church, you can't get a civil divorce, then be remarried, and then receive the sacraments. But if you go to another one, priest or theologian, he will tell you, oh, well, we don't believe that anymore. And don't tell me it's not true. I sit in the meetings with the bishops and the theologians. I didn't read that in The Wanderer. I was there more than once. And so, even today, inside the church, you have conflicting and contradictory opinions, mere opinions, as to what the truth is. And I tell you, the truth is not determined by a consensus or a democratic vote. The truth is what it is what it is. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? Why is the truth constant. Why is it objective? Because the truth in its essence is God himself. Where did everything that is come from? It came from God. There isn't anything that God didn't create. If it's in the universe, God created it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Prologue to the Gospel of John. 
and nothing that came into being came into being other than through his creating hand. God, who is being itself, his very essence is to exist, the one who is the truth, brought all things that are into existence. God himself is the quintessential truth, the objective truth, the immutable truth. All truth subsists in him who is the truth. And that's why the letter to the Hebrews tells us, Jesus Christ, remember what he said, I am the way, the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. The letter to the Hebrews cautions us. We have a lot of strange teaching. Now, how do you know what's true and what's not? Well, God revealed himself to us. God, the truth, revealed himself to us. That's called divine revelation. He revealed himself to us in the person of his only son, Jesus Christ, the truth. And if you want to really know the truth, you have to look at Jesus. You have to look at Jesus with eyes that can see. What did our Lord say? He told us, if you are truly my disciples, you will obey my commandments. And then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Not some illusory freedom. Not some fantasy land freedom. The freedom, the glorious freedom of the children of God. But there's a precondition. If you are my disciples, you will obey my commandments. You must follow the moral precepts, the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's the first step. Then you will be given eyes to see and ears to hear. What a beautiful symphony, the symphony of truth. If you are obedient, then you'll be able to see the truth. Obey my commandments, and then you will know the truth. And that truth will set you free. You see the relationship between truth and freedom. God, our Father, in his great love, revealed himself to us in the person of his only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, one time, was traveling with his disciples. And he asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Some said John the Baptist. Some said Elijah. Some said Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Now note, the first Gallup poll taken by Jesus Christ. <laughs> Who do men say that I am? You know, what, what are they saying about me? Who am I? What do they say? Well, some say this, some say that, some say the other thing. What do you get? You take a poll and you get conflicting and contradictory opinions about the same thing, and they can't all be right. One voice then rang out. Jesus turned on his closest ones, no doubt, his apostles, and he said, but who do you say that I am? One voice. Only one voice rang out. It was the voice of Simon. Thou art the Christ. Son of the living God. Ah, Simon, no mere man has revealed this to you but my heavenly Father. And I, for my part, declare that you are a rock. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is a theological error that has been in the air for some time. Certain educated persons, persons who have been educated, I might add, into imbecility, have told us that Jesus Christ didn't institute a church. Now I want you to look at that 16th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew, and if you are in your right mind, I want you to think about this. 
It's Jesus Christ who's talking. I declare a divine subject of action. Jesus is a divine person. He has assumed a human nature, but the subject of action is divine, God and Son of God. I, for my part, declare you are a rock. And upon this rock, I, a divine I, will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so God institutes his church. He changed Peter's name, Rock. If you look at the Old Testament, and you look at the word rock capitalized as a name, presented as a name, you will see that it refers to God. It shows up a few times in the Old Testament. God, the rock, capital R, of my salvation. The rock of the ages. Jesus calls Simon rock. Now, he's not saying that Simon is God, no. But what he's doing is he is grafting Simon into himself. Jesus is the rock, the chief cornerstone upon which his church is built. And that's why the church isn't going anywhere. And the prognosticators of doom, the morticians of God, who've already said God is dead, hope to bury the church. But they hope in vain, for the church will go on. They kick against the rock. They will not break the rock. The rock is Christ. And Christ has grafted Peter into himself. It is a mystical marriage. Jesus, the head of his mystical body, the church, the church, his beloved bride and body, the two have become one flesh in the divine person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus and his church are one. And Jesus speaks through Peter. Whatever you hold bound on earth shall be held bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's talking to Peter and his successor. All the successors of Peter, the popes. The bishops in union with them, the magisterium. I'm going to give you the shortcut right here. If you have been confused in the past as to what to believe, if you aren't quite sure whose voice to listen to inside the church, as well as out there, I'm going to tell you, listen to Peter. Listen to the Holy Father. Listen to the one who recognized Christ for who he really is. God is so smart, smarter than us. He knew we needed help to understand the truth. And so he gave us a church, and he gave us a visible head of the church. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. The rock is Christ. His church is built on him. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but he's grafted Peter into himself so that when Peter speaks in faith and morals, it is Christ speaking through him. And so if you want to know what to believe, if you want to know what the church teaches, you listen to the voice of the Holy Father, the bishops united to him, the magisterium. That is the teaching office of the church. There is no magisterium of theologians. There is a magisterium of the bishops united to the Holy Father. It's called apostolic succession. It's passed on. Jesus taught orally. Jesus didn't write a book. He did not even write the Bible. Now be sure, the Bible has God as its primary author. But when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, he taught orally. He taught primarily his apostles. And then his apostles taught all of the others. Through a special charism, the teaching of Jesus Christ was passed on from the apostles to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome, that's called apostolic succession. And there was a guarantee of the truth given to them. Now, you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We know that. But you and I don't have a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think they have a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. They think, well, I'm charismatic. Yeah, me too. Great. Glad to hear it. 
I have the Holy Spirit. Amen. You do. So do I. But don't think everything that pops into your beady little brain is coming from the Holy Spirit. Because there's more than one spirit wandering around out there. And some of them are good and some of them are bad. And you've got to discern the spirits. But there is a guarantee of the Holy Spirit given to the church's magisterium, given to the Holy Father and the bishops united to him when they speak definitively in faith and morals, when they teach us as the apostles taught, as Jesus taught them. That is where the essence of our faith comes from. That's how you know the truth. I'm going to give you a real shortcut. In 1996, I took a year of my life to do something I felt very, very committed to. I felt I had to do this at least once. I taught the catechism of the Catholic Church cover to cover for a bishop in California. He asked me to do it. I said no three times. And then finally I got the idea I was supposed to do it, so I did. They told me nobody will come. This is post-Vatican II. Nobody is interested in catechisms. You know, we, we just want to love each other. We don't need to learn all that doctrine stuff. Don't confuse us with facts. And so they said, you won't get anybody to come to this thing. It's ill-fated. Forget it. And so I smiled at the bishop, and he smiled at me, and we went ahead and did it anyway. First month, January, we got the biggest parish hall in the diocese. We stuffed in more than a thousand people. We had closed circuit televisions in remote locations. That shut them up. By the second month, we couldn't hold it there anymore. We had to rent the Sacramento Convention Center because 2,000 showed up. Every month, the people of God came out and they sat packing that auditorium, listening to their faith, knowing that that is the Word of God. That's God's revelation to us. It's important. Listen, if God said it, I want to listen to it. God doesn't say unnecessary and unimportant things. If God sent his only son, then I've got to be real interested in that. From all eternity, God spoke but one word, his eternal word. Jesus is the word of God. In that one word is all wisdom, all knowledge, all truth. Next year, God willing, I'm doing a television series for EWTN. It'll be called Our Father's Word. It's going to be 13 shows on 13 words, showing how every key word, faith, hope, charity, humility, Eucharist, 13 words, how they have intelligibility and power because they subsist in the Word, Jesus. The substance of our faith is Jesus. Our hope is Jesus. Our love is Jesus. Humility is Jesus. The cross, Jesus. Resurrection is Jesus. Life is Jesus. The way is Jesus. The truth is Jesus. And there isn't anything else because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Lord. And if he said it, I want to know about it. He taught us truth. I want to know that truth. To study your faith is to study Jesus Christ. Don't think there's some kind of dichotomy between Christ and his teaching, the teaching of the church. That truth will set you free. Very often in traveling around, preaching, hearing confessions, people tell me horror stories. You know, it's kind of like this. I go places once a month. I live up in the mountains, in the Sierra Mountains on the property of a Carmelite monastery. I live in a hermitage. You know what a hermitage is? It's a little cabin. My hermitage is a little wooden cabin, 20 by 24 feet. That's the exterior dimension, so it's smaller than that inside. I have a little chapel. In that little chapel is Jesus in the tabernacle. I celebrate Mass there. I pray there. I live there alone with him 80% of my life. Now, why would I do that? Why would I do that when there's such a need in the church and in the world to proclaim this mighty word, to proclaim this truth? I do it because unless I'm alone with the word, 
and no words coming out of this mouth worth listening to. You have to be with the Word. You have to spend time with Him. You have to be filled with Him, for indeed you cannot give what you do not have. I found out a couple days ago that I'm going to speak to some of the priests in the diocese on Wednesday. I didn't know that until the day before yesterday. Thanks a lot. <laughs> now, I love priests, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's hard to, to speak to your own peers. You know, that's... Um, I can't tell our brother priests anything they don't already know. They have the same basic education I have. What am I going to... What am I going to say to them? I can't give them a theology lecture. I put them to sleep. What am I going to tell them? I don't know. The Holy Spirit knows, though. I'll guarantee you this, so I'm going to talk from the heart. I'm going to talk from the heart about this Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to talk about the Eucharistic Jesus. That's where all power comes from. That's where the priesthood is centered on. If you don't have a great love for Jesus in the Eucharist as a priest or a layperson, or religious, then you're in big trouble. And we're in big trouble today. Now, you see, you've got to come back to that over and over again. Obey him. Obey the commandments if you want to be free. There's an external freedom and an interior freedom. Now, I'm going to tell you why we're losing our freedom in this country, and I'm, this is a radical statement. Undoubtedly, I'll get in trouble for it over and over again. But I am telling you that we are headed for big trouble in this country, even totalitarianism. Why? Because interiorly, we are losing our freedom. And when you lose it inside, it won't be long till you lose it outside. That freedom in the exterior order flows from that interior freedom. Now, what is freedom? Where does it come from? Well, we have an idea what the truth is now. You as Catholics have a tremendous advantage because your church teaches the fullness of truth. You should love the truth. Do you love the truth? I hope you love the truth. I hope you love that beautiful symphony of truth. I hope you have ears for truth. You know, the truth really is a symphony. If you have been trained in music, you know the difference between a good note and a bad note. Somebody hits a discordant note, you recognize it. Same thing with the symphony of truth. If somebody says something outside the truth, you ought to be able to pick up that discordant note. If somebody tells you, like they told a little girl that I know, she has a youth ministry, her and her fiancé, they got a new chaplain, and the kids were asking questions the first meeting. And one of the kids, who's kind of a half-wise guy, he said, well, what about sex, Father? After all, it is the 90s. Have things changed? Has the church's position changed? And this poor girl told me that poor father, who was a young priest, said, well, we used to believe that that was a mortal sin, and of course you couldn't do it, but now we have become more enlightened. And if you have a meaningful relationship... It's not so bad. It's possible. And this little girl, she's four foot ten, come up out of her chair like a trident missile. <laughs> and she said, what? She heard a discordant note. That wasn't the symphony of truth she heard. That was some kind of real mess. And she challenged him on it, but she's not a theologian. She called us. I was in the middle of dinner. She called up in tears, very upset. Where is that in the catechism? I know it's in there. What page is it on? She was desperate. But you see, that goes on. And poor people are very often confused. I started to tell you, in traveling around, talking to people, I hear so many horror stories. People come to me in, in shackles. If I were to have eyes to see spiritual reality, sometimes I would see poor people weighed down with chains, hardly able to walk, shackled by their sins coming towards me. They're in agony. Father, years ago I did this, I did this, I did this, and I asked, is that really a sin? 
and I was told, oh no, that's not really a sin anymore, or, well, just follow your conscience. What conscience? Conscience is not something found in a vacuum. The Second Vatican Council mentions conscience 72 times in its 16 documents. Not once does it fail to use a modifying term. Good conscience, bad conscience, well-formed conscience, malformed conscience, I'm going to add one. Dead conscience. You can murder your conscience. How do you do that? By abusing it. By abusing it. I remember when I was a high school student, I lived in the old days. I used to walk to school a mile through the snow. <laughs> you better believe it. But see, in those days I was cool. And it wasn't cool to wear a hat, even if it was 30 below zero. So I used to get my left ear frozen. The wind would blow off the Hudson River, and I'd walk that mile. And by the time I got to my locker in school, my left ear was frozen. Frostbite hurts. You ever get frostbitten? Wow. It would start to thaw out by first period. And you could hear a blood-curdling scream every once in a while. It was me. Boy, that hurt. Well, what happened after a while, I began to lose the feeling. Why? Well, I abused it. Your body's not meant to be abused that way. Your nerves lose their feeling. So I abused that, that faculty, that sense, and I lost it. Now, what happens if you abuse your conscience? You have to lose it. How do you abuse your conscience? Well, it goes like this. Maybe you tell a lie when you're younger. Oh, uh, I'm just going to go over to my friend Tommy's house. I'm not going to that party, don't worry, that mom told me not to go to. And of course, that's where I go. And I feel guilty about it. But I get over it, and the next time I do the same thing, and then maybe a little worse, and then maybe it leads to something else. I'm not listening to the voice of conscience. And so what happens? I kill my conscience. I dull the sensitivity of my conscience. Now, what is conscience? Well, it's not some kind of subjective entity. It's not something that's divorced from everything else in life. Vatican II tells us that in the depths of his conscience, Man detects a law which he does not impose upon himself, but which holds him to obedience, always summoning him to love the good and avoid evil. The voice of conscience can, when necessary, speak to his heart more specifically. Do this, avoid that. What is conscience, though? We hear about this, well, follow your conscience. All right, here's the church's definition of conscience, a very traditional definition. Conscience is a judgment of the practical intellect. It applies to a concrete situation, the rational conviction that we must do good and avoid evil. So conscience is a judgment. Conscience is a judgment of the practical intellect. Look, if it's a judgment, it can be right or wrong. And I can be just as sincerely wrong as I am sincerely right. And what happens to people is, after a while, when you begin to sin and sin, you begin to dull your conscience, and then pretty soon you can do anything. I remember my poor mother used to say to me, doesn't your conscience bother you? And I could say, in all honesty, no. <laughs> Don't bother me a bit. Matter of fact, I kind of like my sins. Why? Because I'd murdered my conscience. I'd killed it in cold blood. I didn't listen to it. I denied it and denied it. I dulled it. Finally, I killed it. You know, one too many times, and then it just doesn't work anymore. And so you can be involved in all kinds of immoral things, and your conscience doesn't protest anymore because it's dead. And so when someone tells you, oh, well, just follow your conscience, know what they're talking about. You know, what conscience are we talking about here? A well-formed conscience? How should you form your conscience? To the truth. You have to put on the mind of Christ. You have to know the teaching of the church. You have to know the moral teaching of the church. 
You know, the Ten Commandments are still there. Some people think the name was changed <laughs> to the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> no, there's still the Ten Commandments, and we got to do it. If we're smart, what happens if we obey those commandments? Then we know the truth. We have eyes for truth. We can hear the truth, the beautiful resonant notes of the symphony of truth. Then we know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Conscience is not an independent and exclusive capacity to decide what is good and evil. Conscience has to be formed to the truth. I've got to look at the truth and form my conscience in accord with it. I have to look at the church's teaching, like on the sixth commandment. The church teaches me about human sexuality, that it's beautiful and sacred, that it's not something to be trampled upon and trivialized. It's something godly, where two people who love each other and are in the sacrament of matrimony together enter into God's love, his creative power. That's sacred. That's holy unto the Lord. Don't trample what's holy. Don't profane what's holy. That's what the, word, the world does, profanes what is holy. And so I have to form my conscience to that truth, the truth of the Sixth Commandment, that sexuality is for marriage, that any sexual relations outside of marriage, that's, that's a no-no for me. What, what happens if I do that? I hurt myself, and I hurt the other person, and I hurt the whole world because my very moral being begins to unravel. The whole world is unraveling because millions of individuals are unraveling morally and we have a disaster on our hands. And so we have to form our conscience to the truth and then that truth sets us free. What is freedom? I give a lot of definitions because it's good to know things. Otherwise, you can't assume anything. I remember my high school chemistry teacher, Mr. Stiles, one day he said, he was teaching us something about chemistry, and he said, now do not assume, and he wrote it on the blackboard. He said, because if you assume, you will make a, then he underlined the first part of it, out of you and me. Don't assume. You can't assume anything. You have to hit these things head on. If I say freedom to the average Western mind, that conjures up a definition to be able to do what I want to do. Most people think freedom is being able to do what you want to do. That is not freedom. I've said this, I said it yesterday. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want to do. Freedom is the power to do what you ought to do. It's an interior power. I'll tell you this. No government, no evil regime, no ungodly people can enslave me because they can't get inside me. They may do great evil and try to enslave me from the outside. There may be illegal laws, there may be terrible discrimination, there may be bigotry that is a hellish thing, but they cannot get inside of me because I am free to the depths of my being because Christ the Liberator has set me free. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And nobody can take that freedom away from you. That is an interior freedom. And from that interior freedom flows that freedom that we see in societies. But when individuals through immorality, through not forming their consciences to the truth, begin to lose that interior liberty to do what's right, to do what they ought to do. They become enslaved, and then they begin to radiate that slavery onto those around them. They are enslaved to lust. They are enslaved to power. They are enslaved to any number of things, money. And in that interior slavery, they radiate that to the world around them. And I tell you something, we are in dire straits. When Satan one day in January of 1973 donned judicial garb 
and gavel in hand swept into the corridors of the Supreme Court and presided over Roe versus Wade, that was the beginning of the loss of freedom. For at that point, we suppressed the freedom of the most helpless. At that point, we did away with the freedom of the most innocent, the very most basic right, the right to life, went by the wayside. And now, euthanasia in one state, who knows what's next? Then who will decide if you should live or die? Oh, first it's because you're sick. Maybe you're too young. Maybe that babe in the womb is inconvenient. Next, maybe Aunt Mary is inconvenient, or your mother or your father. Who will decide in 20 years if you should die or if I should die? Who will say if my quality of life is not what they think it should be and perhaps I should no longer live? We are slipping. Our freedom is being eroded away because the interior liberty of the individual human person has been attacked. That moral freedom which comes from adherence to the truth is slipping away. And unless you do something about it, and unless I do something about it, we are in grave danger that our country will no longer be the land of the free. It is unraveling my brothers and sisters. And so what can we do? Quite simply, learn the truth. Know the truth, form your conscience to that truth, and then stand fast in it. You remember my friend Rose, my first love, little Rose. Oh, little Rose used to, she, we used to talk about these things quite a lot, and then as we grew older, we went our separate ways. I was in Hollywood as I was older in business, and I hadn't talked to her a long time. She went away to school. She was in the, she went to the Juilliard School of Music in New York. And she called me one day out in Hollywood, and she was interested in a career in the entertainment business. And I said, well, I do know some people in that business, but I hesitated. You know, Rose was, to me, she was so innocent, so pure, so beautiful. I didn't really want to expose her to that, but she talked me into it. So I introduced her to some people in that business. And then I didn't hear from her for about a year. Then one night, oh, it was early in the morning, the telephone rang. Frightening thing, a phone call in the middle of the night. It was a voice I did not recognize. Rose is dying. You must come to this address. It was an address in a bad area of Hollywood. And so I raced through the streets of Los Angeles, into Hollywood, into an alley. And as the headlights played against the darkness, there were three or four people huddled around a woman fallen on the ground, and they all scurried off like rats. I got out of the car. There was a young woman on the ground of the alley, dressed like a street prostitute. I went up to her, picked her up, and recognized my beautiful rose, my innocent, pure rose. And I held her in my arms, and her eyes fluttered, focused for a moment. She recognized me. How did it come to this? How could it have come to this, she said. And then she died. Died of a cocaine overdose. Young, intelligent, beautiful, gifted. Something had gone wrong. Something had gone very wrong. Our idea of truth, our conscience, our freedom lost. And in that terrible darkness, another 
child of God goes the wrong way. Oh, I've prayed for ever since then. My brothers and sisters, the truth is not a matter of indifference. The truth is a matter of life or death, the life or the death of your loved ones and mine. Love the truth. Fight for the truth. Form yourself in the truth. That truth which is nothing less than God himself. And then knowing that truth, you will be free. Free with the glorious freedom of the children of God and nobody, no force on the earth or under the earth can ever steal that freedom from you. For when you're free from the inside out, you're free indeed. You're free indeed. God bless you. It says Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And I can understand why he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit at this point. And he offered God our Father praise. Because what you have hidden, what you have hidden from the learned and the clever, you have revealed to the merest children. The highest wisdom, the greatest prudence, the most magnificent knowledge, understanding beyond anything human. God hides that from the learned and the clever, and he reveals it to the merest children, little ones, those who are humble, those who are simple, those who are pure in spirit. This is something that we have to meditate on. We have to really enter into this because what we have here is the first principle of the spiritual life. Everybody wants to achieve their place in history. Everybody wants to be somebody. Everybody wants to make their mark. You only have one life to live. Don't mess it up. Most of us do several times. I know I have. You want to get this one right. We're on this earth a very short time. Scripture says 70 years, 80 for those who are strong, maybe a few more than that for a few people. That's a gift. What are we going to do with that gift? We have to use that gift of time to give glory to God. Don't get sidetracked. We're getting too old to get sidetracked. Don't get sidetracked. You old people, a lot of old people here. I'm getting just like you. Lost my hair, lost my hearing. Can't remember anything anymore. We're getting old. We're getting too old to mess around. We're getting too old to waste time on nonsense. I don't have any time for nonsense. I don't have any time to get sidetracked on nonsense like hustling money and trying to increase in my career and get a new house and a new car. I had all that. I had all that. I had my several million dollar net worth. I drove the red Ferrari. I lived in the house on the beach. I had all that. Empty. Dust. Let me tell you something, it's going in the ground and so are you. You're going to be food for worms. There's a happy thought. You better believe it. That's where you and me are going, the body, but not the soul. The soul's going to go on. The soul's going to go to God, and one day, of course, the body will be reunited with the soul. This same body, you ain't going to get another one, so don't ask. The same one, but it's going to be divinized, spiritualized, elevated in nature. It's going to be beautiful. Matter of fact, we ought, we're going to get our hair back. <laughs> Not even going to be gray. We're going to be shining with all the splendor of the Lord Jesus. And those of us who know suffering, those of us who have known the heat of the day, the noonday sun, 
the difficulties of this life, those of us who've known physical infirmity, those of us who've suffered emotionally, those of us who have suffered spiritually, that's all going to pass away and God himself is going to wipe away every tear. He's going to raise up the fallen and the broken, the little, the humble and the poor. And he's going to give them the recompense. But that's then. What about now? Now, we are at war. We are at war. And that war is a war to end all wars. A war of epic proportions and cosmic scope. It is a war between good and evil, the quintessential war. The war between truth and lies, light and darkness. It is a veritable war between the forces of life and the forces of death. This is the war to end all wars. And I'm going to tell you something. You and I are going to end up a winner or a loser. There isn't any middle ground in this war. You will be a winner or a loser. And I'm challenging you tonight to be a winner. To be a winner with Christ, not a loser. To be a winner. But this is no war for wimps. This is a war for those who are strong in the Lord. You may say, but I'm not strong, I'm weak. Say, I'm right there with you. I'm weak too. I know all about weakness. I've been weak all my life. Thought I was strong. Kept getting knocked down. Finally figured it out. I'm not strong, I'm weak. But I know this. When I am weak, then I am strong. Oh, I can't do anything. I learned that some time ago. I tried and I tried and I couldn't make it. The devil's been telling me, you can't do anything. I'm going to whoop your butt. And I tell him, I can do all things. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. I can scale any wall. I can knock down any stronghold. Why? Because in Jesus, I can do anything. I can go any place. I can win. And I intend to win this war. You and I are involved in a battle of epic proportions. You've got to be strong to fight in the war. I remember when I was 18 years old, Vietnam was going on. And in those days, I could say having more zeal than brains, I enlisted in the Army for the Green Berets. And I went in the Army and I went through that training, and it was hard. It was very difficult, day after day, night after night, driven to within an inch of your life, thought you couldn't make it, pushed beyond your endurance. But you find out that you have more than you thought you had. But that kind of training is nothing. That kind of war is nothing because in that war, yes, there are casualties, you can get killed. But in this war, you not only get killed physically, if you get killed in this war, it's permanent. Because there are two results in this war. It's called heaven and hell. It's called salvation or not. And we decide. But it's not so easy. It's not so easy. It's easy to say, Lord, Lord. But day in and day out, you've got to prove that your heart and your mind are where your mouth are. You know, put your money where your mouth are. Well, put your faith where your declaration of faith is. You've got to fight it out. My friends, I met some of your beautiful children the last couple of days. I was highly impressed by your children. You have wonderful children. These are some of the nicest, most beautiful children that I've ever met any place in the whole world. I don't know what it is. They must have good parents, I guess. But beautiful children, and when I look at them, I am inspired. I am inspired to fight this good fight. But let me tell you something. Satan wants your children dead in a garbage can. When I lived in Hollywood, I had a friend who was a detective. And every now and then, he'd take me for a ride through his 
place where he worked in Hollywood. Twice, he showed me scenes that even back in those days when I was pretty hard-hearted and crass, boy, they struck me to the heart. Little children, well, I say little children, 12 years old, that's a child to me, 12, 13, 14 years old, dead in garbage cans, literally, I'm, I'm talking literal here, in an alley in a garbage can, dead, killed by their pimp. That's right, they'd been prostitutes for two and three years on drugs. That is going on right now. It's going on in every major city in this country. That's the external manifestation of this combat. If you want to deal with something, you have to go to the order of causes. If you have a disease, you can't just treat the symptoms. If you have a cancerous lesion, you just can't put a Band-Aid on it and think it's going to get better. You've got to go to the root cause. This scourge that we have today, this scourge of drugs and promiscuity, impurity, that is a symptom. And we have to go to the underlying cause. And I tell you something, a lot of the blame falls on us. Used to be I got very upset about these things. I would get very upset and I would blame the president. And I would blame the Congress, and I would blame the bishop, and I would blame the pastor for this, that, and the other thing. I don't blame them anymore. I don't point the finger that way anymore. I turn it around and point it right here. It's my fault. You know why it's my fault? You know why it's my fault that those little girls are turned into prostitution? You know why it's my fault that all those people are heading for the drug dealer? It's my fault because I have failed to be holy enough. That's why it's my fault, because I have failed to be as holy as God calls me to be. And I'll tell you this, when enough of us become as holy as we are called to be, the devil is going to take a beating. And so I'm calling you, I am challenging you to put on the armor to pick up the sword and to do what you need to do. Don't waste your time on nonsense. Oh, you've got to make a living, I know that. You've got to have a house, you've got to have a, enough money to get by, of course. But what I'm saying is, you will not be judged on that basis when you stand before God. He won't ask you how much money you made. He will not ask you what your net worth was. He won't ask you how many VCRs or cars or houses you had. But he is apt to ask you what you did with the gift of time and what you did to stand in the gap to protect his little ones. Do you know how much God loves every human being? You look at one of these beautiful little children. You look at their innocent face. You look at them and you have a dim intimation of the beauty of a human person, every human person, we all start out that way. We all start out as some mama's baby, beloved, beautiful, innocent, pure. And then the world gets hold of us, an impure world, a world bent on destruction. Well, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And I don't want to put up with it anymore. And you say, well, you don't have any choice. Oh, yes, I do. I'm coming out swinging. Look out. I'm coming out swinging because this is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual war. And you have to fight a spiritual war with spiritual weapons. Mere social weapons aren't enough. Political weapons, not enough. Talk is cheap. What we have to do is enter into this warfare with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Some of you may not believe me. Some of you may think, well, he's, I don't know what he's talking about tonight. I'm going to tell you something. You've got to be little to understand this. That's why Jesus rejoiced in spirit. Because only little ones, only humble ones, only simple ones can understand this kind of spiritual truth. If you can understand this, that's a blessing. And every blessing carries with it a commensurate responsibility. St. Paul told us all about this, this spiritual warfare. In the sixth chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, put on the armor of God. You remember it. Finally, be strong in the Lord. 
and in the strength of his might. Are you strong in the Lord? Are you strong in the Lord, or is your religion just a category? Is your religion a category, like work, recreation, or are you strong in the Lord? And in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, St. Paul says. Put on the whole armor of God. He didn't say, put on half the armor of God. Because if you put half of it on or part of it on, you're only halfway protected. You're only partly protected, and the devil's a good shot. And where there isn't any armor, you have to get hit. Do that, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. He's talking about fallen angels here. These are choirs of angels, principalities and powers. Those are choirs of angels. The fall of the angels is a doctrine of the faith. It's right there in the catechism. We've always believed that. You'd be amazed how many people don't believe it. How many theologians don't believe it? Oh, angels. Well, that's just a literary device in sacred scripture. I'm going to tell you what. I hope one of them their literary devices jumps up and hits you right between the eyes and wakes you up. The angels are real. That's a doctrine of the faith. You can't read the Bible without stumbling across angels. Look it up in a concordance how many times the angels appear, the fallen angels. This is real. Now, if you are so sophisticated and so educated that you no longer believe the basics of your faith, you're in trouble. And you need to take stock of where you are. You need to go back and become like a little child and accept these things with humility. God has a message for you. And the message is get educated in your faith, at least know the basics, and then go forth armed with those basics to do battle for my little children. That's what God wants from you. We waste too much time. You know, we fiddle while Rome burns. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand fast, gird your loins with truth. I talked about the truth last night. Did you gird your loins with the truth? You've got to know the truth. Are you clear on the truth? You do not have to be a theologian to understand your faith well. You have an obligation to seek the truth. You have a moral obligation to seek the truth. There's a principle in civil law. Ignorance, or any law, ignorance of the law is no defense. Well, ignorance of the law is somewhat of a defense with the good Lord. There is such a thing as invincible ignorance. But you all aren't going to be able to plead it. Because when you stand before God, you will not be able to plead ignorance. No, you're here. You're here. You've been told. You have a gift like the catechism, and it's your fault if you don't pick it up. It's your fault if you don't read it and study it. It's not my fault. I told you to do it since the day I get it. I know your pastor probably tells you to do it. Your priests tell you to do it. You've got to do it. You can't give what you don't have. How are you going to give that to your children if you don't have it first? Don't think that the, par- the parish has the responsibility for educating your children in the faith. It doesn't. It does not. Every major document on catechesis that the church has ever produced lays the responsibility right on the parents. You're the first line of catechesis. The parish can help you and should help you. But you parents, that's where the children get their faith. And if you don't know it, if you don't have it, how are you going to pass it on? I'm telling you, this is one of the major gaps in our defenses today. Because even inside the Catholic Church, we don't know our faith. And how are we going to radiate that faith to the rest of the world if we don't even know it? You better learn it, and you better learn it fast, because if you don't learn it, you're apt to lose it. 
This is happening by the millions. A few years ago, I was in a meeting with several bishops in Central America, and they were bitterly lamenting the fact that in three years they had lost over five million Catholics in their countries. They lost them to the Jehovah's Witnesses, to the Mormons, and to the Evangelical Protestants. Over five million in a few short years. Why did they lose them? Well, there might be more than one reason, but I'll give you one reason. They didn't know what they were losing. They didn't know what they were walking out on. Otherwise, they could have never walked out. If we knew what we had, how could we walk out on it? If you really believe that you have Jesus in the Eucharist, where are you going? If you really believe you have a spiritual mother who happens to be the mother of God, where are you going? If you really believe you have the fullness of revealed truth and a magisterium, a teaching office, to guide you in all that truth, where are you going? Why are you exchanging higher truth for lower truth, more truth for less truth? Where are you going? You're going because you don't know what you have. You don't know the gift of your faith. That's why most of them left. They had never learned their faith. It might not have been their fault. Maybe we didn't teach them. I don't blame anyone. But maybe we priests were at fault. Same goes for us. You know, we're at the head of the list. We can't give what we don't have. With fear and trepidation, I approach my mission tomorrow to talk to the priests. I was preaching once in Central America in the country of Belize, and I was with a particular lay evangelist on this mission. And one, it was Saturday morning, the last day of the mission. It was an auditorium like this, about a thousand people in it. And it was uh, actually the Pilate Convent in Belize City. And I was preaching on the Blessed Mother. It was Saturday, I thought, well, I'll preach on Our Lady. And so I was just giving a kind of a general teaching on the Blessed Mother by going through the rosary. And I got, no, oh, I was only ten minutes into the talk. And I said, uh, of all the creatures that God has ever created, our Blessed Mother is the most beautiful, the highest of all creatures. Now, Jesus is, is God. He's a divine person. He's not a human person. He's a divine person. His human nature, of course, is the greatest work of God's creating hand. But of all the creatures, Our Lady is the greatest. And at that point, there was a lot of proselytization going on. And the first row was all Protestant ministers. And I, and I love them. They're, many, they're wonderful Christians. And um, I'm not sure why they had come to listen to me. Uh, but one of them jumped up at that point. And he started screeching at the top of his lungs, No, no, no! And as one lady would later remark, Father, your charism at that point shifted into overdrive. <laughs> Something happened. It did. It sure enough did. Something happened, all right, because what happened, I didn't have time to think. It was not a cognitive process. A synthesized, condensed, distilled five minutes of doctrine came out of my mouth with power. <laughs> Someone said it looked like flames. <laughs> I don't remember what I said, but I preached something on Our Lady about the truth. At that point, a thousand people leaped to their feet and started cheering wildly. There was 80-year-old nuns dancing in the, in the aisles. <laughs> Literally. I'll tell you why. For 20 years, they had been intimidated into thinking, well, we, you didn't really get it right 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And I'm telling them what they heard 50, 60 or more years ago the basics of the faith, they heard it, they recognized it, they knew it, and they leaped to their feet with joy because they recognized the truth when they heard it. The place went wild. After it simmered down, that lay evangelist came up to me and he, he, was, he was just shaking. He was so excited. And he said, oh, oh, Father, ain't this just wonderful? This is just great. He said, if we get just a little bit better at this, surely they'll kill us for it. 
Well, praise the Lord. Maybe they will. We got to get good enough at it so that we do make a difference. We've got to learn our faith. We've got to know it not just as something we've memorized or something we've learned in a book. To know your faith is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you interiorize him, you can make him present. That's what this is all about, to make Jesus present. Exactly three months to the day before she died, I had a private meeting with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I was preaching at the National Basilica in Washington, D.C., and Mother was there to receive an award from Congress. We had a call, and I went over to concelebrate Mass, and afterwards the nuns, the sisters told me, Mother wants to meet with you privately, and so I had a 40-minute private meeting with Mother Teresa. And among other things, she gave me a mission. I had been giving retreats to her sisters, the missionaries of charity, for a while. Mother looked at me. The first thing she said to me, Father, look at me. I said, yeah, Mother, I'm looking. She said, Father, look how little I am. I said, you sure are little, Mother. <laughs> she said, you, you're little than the last time I remember. <laughs> She's in a wheelchair. She's kind of bent over as she had been for a long time, worn out with the Lord's labor. She said, look how little I am and look how sick I am. Look how frail I am. Look how poor I am. And she was the picture of littleness and humility and poverty. She was just worn out from hard labor. Her hands were like the hands of an old workman. Her hands reminded me of maybe an old farmer. A farmer who'd worked the land for 60, 70, 80 years. That's what her, she had strong hands. She'd worked hard. She said, Look what an unlikely candidate I am, Father. And now I want you to look at all God's done through me. I have over 5,000 sisters. Did you know that Mother Teresa is the founder? with the greatest number of religious in her own lifetime in the entire history of the church, she surpassed St. Francis of Assisi several years ago. There was never a founder of a religious institute who had more members in their lifetime than Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Over 5,000 when she died. She said, Father, I have almost 600 houses all over the world. In the city of Calcutta alone, we picked up over 60,000 dying people. That's what God's done through a weak, poor, simple little woman. God works one person at a time. You have gifts. You have potential. You are made in God's own image and likeness. What he can do with you is beyond your wildest dreams. You need to give yourself to him. You need to not hold back on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be available. He doesn't need your ability. He needs your availability. Mother told me, don't worry, Father. Don't worry if you don't have any big victories. Don't worry if you're not converting people by the thousands. God's not looking for that. He's looking for fidelity, day in and day out. He wants you to be faithful, in season, out of season. If you have to be hidden, forgotten, it's all right. Just go about your work for the Lord. Sometimes that work is very hidden. Sometimes the mission that God has assigned to you might be a very hidden mission. Maybe it's to pray in solitude. Maybe it's just to pray in your own place. I remember my grandmother, my Aunt Mary, they'd worked for the church, they took care of the rectory, oh, I don't know, 60 years, I guess. Every day they'd walk to church, rain, snow, didn't matter, you could see them both. In their later years, two little women walking through the snow, you know, 70, almost 80 years old. Aunt Mary was the organist, she was the chief catechist, she was the cook. Grandma cleaned the rectory. You know, they, they did everything. They were going to bestow the title Monsignor on them, but... 
They didn't get that far, but then the day came where they couldn't do any more hard physical work. They got old. People always said, oh, poor Angie. She can't do anything anymore. She can't work. She she's, was always so active. She can't be in the church. She can't help the priest. She must be very sad. My grandmother always had a good sense of humor. She was always joking right to the end on her deathbed. She made the nurses laugh within 30 seconds of passing on. I don't remember a single time ever visiting my grandmother in those years where she didn't have a rosary in her hand. And she was praying. And the nurses told me she prayed day and night without stopping year after year after year. She was not retired. She had not stepped out of the battle. She had stepped up in the battle. Her position wasn't reduced. It was increased. She had been promoted. She was on the front line. She had the weapon in her hand. And she was using it. She was praying. And souls were being saved. You may be called to that, a quiet place. You may be called to the cross. Remember that the cross is the greatest weapon. It's how Jesus struck down sin, Satan, and death. Maybe you have a cross. Maybe you suffer. Maybe you can't do the things that some people can do. Jesus couldn't do much stretched out on that cross except redeem the entire universe. And maybe he's called you to do that in him. Maybe he's called you to be a victim soul. Every one of us is going to get old. Every one of us is probably going to get sick at some time or another. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get old. Don't be afraid to get sick. Don't be afraid of infirmity and don't be afraid of death. Look it right in the eye because Jesus has already been there. He's already been there and he's already won that battle for you. All you have to do is be Faithful, faithful to the end. And in doing that, you will be a warrior. You will be fighting the good fight. You might say, but I, I'm so busy, Father, I have to work. I have to support my family. I understand that. You do it and do it well. But when you're doing it, who are you doing it for? Doing it for the Lord? That's who you got to do it for. When you go to work every morning, it's hard. I know it's hard. I don't know how you people do it. If I had to get up every morning and go to work, I don't think I'd make it. You're very heroic. But I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd have to give it to Jesus. I'd have to say, Lord, this is for you. This day is for you. This job is for you. This whatever it is that I do. If I'm making widgets on an assembly line, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a lawyer, no matter what I am, I have to be doing that for God. I have to be giving that through an act of my will to the good Lord. That fills it with power. That makes it meaningful. No matter how poor you are, just like I said to that man in that downtown mission, he said, I don't have anything to give. I don't have anything to give to God. He thought I meant money. I wasn't talking about money. I'm talking about your heart. Is your heart beating? Well, then give every beat of your heart to the good Lord. Are you breathing? And give every breath to him. Every step you walk, every word you speak, give it all to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will take it and he will use it. You live and move and have your being in him. You've got to be able to say it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. That's where the power is and that's the meaning of life. You've got to have a reason to live. You've got to have a reason to live, and a lot of people are losing their reason to live. If I didn't have what I have in my priesthood, I wouldn't have a reason to live. I live to fight in this battle. Because God's little children are falling into hell like snowflakes. That's what Our Lady said at Fatima. Souls fall into hell like snowflakes because there's no one to pray and do penance for them. Because there's no one to pray and do penance for them. Most of the people in the world won't pray for themselves. They're helpless. I was helpless. And so somebody else had to do it for me. My mother, yes, and other people too. 
Because I was helpless. When a man is up to his neck in quicksand, don't tell him, hey, why don't you get out of there? He can't. He can't. He's right up to his neck, and he can't jump out of there. He needs somebody to pull him out from the outside. I remember the days when I was down and out, and I want to tell you something I know about down, and I know about out. After having been a multimillionaire, I crashed to the ground and burned. I know all about it. I know all about the darkness of drugs. I know all about waking up in strange places and not even knowing where the heck I am. I've been there. I've been through darkness. But somebody was praying. Somebody in the church was praying. Somebody had a rosary in their hand. Somebody was at Mass. Somebody was praising the Lord. Somebody was interceding, standing in the gap. I should have been dead a thousand times over. But I'm not dead, I'm here. Because somebody was praying, somebody was fighting, somebody was involved in this war. You know, most people sleep through the war. This war is a constant. People come and people go. People live their whole lives and sleep right through the war. They're not aware that anything's going on. They don't care that anything's going on. They don't mind. It's just a statistic that so many people die from this and that and the other thing. So many people die from drugs. So many people die from violence. So many people die from abortion. Just statistics. We're divorced from it. Just numbers on a paper. No, those are real, live people. Every one of whom God would have shed his precious blood and did. Every one. One time God showed me a soul. It was a strange experience. I can't explain it to you, for those things defy explanation. But upon beholding this, it was so beautiful. Such a love filled me that it changed me forever. God loves every one of us so much that the loss of any one of us is a tragedy beyond comprehension. Now imagine, you good mothers and fathers, if you lost one of your children. I had a little sister. She was killed in a car wreck with four other children. She was 14 years old, coming home from a football game. Hit a tree, and the kids were killed. Now, I know what that did to my mother. I, I watched that for several years, you can imagine. She was the last one home, the baby. Now think about God, our Heavenly Father. In his infinite perfection, how much more perfectly he loves everyone. And the loss of anyone is a tragedy beyond imagination. If you want to please God, give him children. If you want to please God, protect his children through prayer, through penance, through telling the truth, living the truth, being courageous. Don't back off. Don't waste your time. The clock is ticking. And every moment is a moment closer to eternity for you and for me. We can't waste any more time, my friends. We are at war, and the war is going badly. And it seems very much to me that the forces of evil right now have the upper hand. Oh, you see that in the divorce rate. You see that in the murder rate. You see that in the abortion rate. You see it through the blood and violence of Waco. You see it through the tears of Oklahoma City. You see it in so much despair in our country, darkness. People falling by the wayside, poverty increasing for so many. Seems that evil is holding sway. Evil's having its hour, but the day of the Lord is coming. Every one of us has to be part of that. My brothers and sisters, please, take this seriously. Please make a promise to God that from this night forward you're going to do something. Pray the rosary every day. It's got to be concrete. Pray the rosary every day. You know what the rosary is? It's a powerful weapon. It's the prayer of the gospel. That's what it is. 
I have, you know, I've, a lot of my Protestant friends have started praying the rosary. W one time I said to a good pastor, a Baptist, a Southern Baptist, <laughs> I, said, I said, Pastor, I said, how often you pray the rosary? <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, how often you pray the rosary? Are you crazy? Said, what you got against the rosary? Why do we don't do that? I said, why not? What you got against the gospel? You don't want to say that to a good Baptist. They love the word of God, and rightly so. What do you got against the gospel? I, well, nothing. I said, well, the prayer of the rosary is the prayer of the gospel. What are you talking about? And I showed him. I showed him. The mysteries of the rosary are the soul of the rosary. The soul is the life. Hmm. The, the principle of the body, that's the soul. That which breathes life into it. Thirteen of the fifteen mysteries are gospel events. Two of them can be deduced. They're Old Testament passages. And when you show them that, they're amazed. And what about the Our Father and the Hail Mary? Gospel prayer? What do you got against praying the gospel? It's one thing to read the gospel. What you got against praying the gospel? Start praying the gospel. What's the gospel? Word means good news. What's the good news? Something? No. Somebody. His name is Jesus. So when you pray the gospel, you're praying Jesus. And when you pray Jesus, you begin to interiorize Jesus. You begin to become who you are. The living presence of Christ Jesus, the Lord. You pray the rosary, you're going to get strong in the Lord. You're going to be a warrior in this battle. Don't think it's some old lady's prayer. I've been told that. Oh, that's an old lady's prayer. I want to tell you something. Them old ladies stop praying. We're all in big trouble. <laughs> and so pray the rosary. Make a holy hour. Come to the Eucharist, the greatest gift that God has given to his beloved children. Learn your faith. Read the Bible, read the Catechism. Most of all, give your heart and your mind to Jesus. If you're smart, do it through Mary, his mother. People often ask me, why would I do that, Father? Because her hands are more pure than mine. That simple. I take everything I am and everything I do, I give it to Jesus Christ through his mother. Why? Because she's our spiritual mother, she's the mother of God, her hands are immaculate and mine aren't. And so I give her my pittance of an offering. She takes it and purifies it and magnifies it. And then she gives it to her son, who brings it to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's fighting the good fight. That's the combat we're involved in. My brothers and sisters, do it. Like the commercial says, just do it. Enter into this holy war, this holy combat, and I promise you one day you are going to be mightily happy that you did. One day you are going to stand before God Almighty. He's going to smile at you because he's going to see within you the image of his son. He's going to see Jesus shining out of you. He's going to give you the reward that your good works deserve. He's going to bless you. He's going to open his arms to you. And he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.